should be fucking put to death for what they did. There you go, there's a hot take. That's the other thing that's annoying. It's like, not only should this stop, it should cease to exist. Mm. Yeah. And you're like, well, that's a little Trumpy. He goes, ah, we, we, we hit a snag. We really love you. We think you're a star, but we're not taking white guys. And I was just like, what the f You gave people money, limited money, because of the race that they happened to be born into. And you denied it to others on the basis of race. Have you ever thought of moving? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> left-wing conspiracy to deny the presidency to Donald Trump. Absolutely it was, absolutely, right? But I think it was warranted. You're saying you are content with a left-wing conspiracy to prevent somebody being democratically re-elected as president. More commonly, it's called the forced organ harvesting reality in China. They basically looked at all these Chinese, officially published Chinese studies in medical journals, and they found through looking at protocols very carefully, 71 instances in the published literature where people had been killed by heart extraction. I thought that, you know, this is something that starts at the age of 18. But no, I mean, they, they chopped the breasts off of uh, 13 and 14-year-old girls, even younger sometimes. Hey, so what's the one thing? When, <laughs> not when... bad, not bad. <laughs> <laughs>
and it kills, the joke's killed, then I'll do a white room, and they're like, that's offensive to black people. I'm like, well, tell the uh, 200 people, the black people laughing. Man, that is exactly it. what I found. Like, I used to have a bunch of jokes about me having dark skin and, and people thinking I'm from Pakistan and all of that shit. And it was always ethnic minority rooms where that mm -hmm. went down really well. Yeah. And it was always the guilty white people who'd be yeah. like, oh, you exactly. know. Exactly. Every time. So... Isn't that a little fucked up? You're speaking for them? It's this weird soft racism. Hey, they can't handle that. That's <laughs> a little over the line, whatever. And you're like, they've been through so much and you're worried about this joke about not being able to swim, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of weird soft bigotry of like, we'll handle this, they're brown, yeah. let us do it. And you're like, well, how come that's not offensive? Yeah. But yeah. then making the joke was. And I think the joke thing, to your point, is just, I think it's a young, a generational thing. I think younger people maybe, they're, they're, they grew up with this online outrage and like, we gotta stop this, we gotta stop that. And so then they see it in real life and they weren't ready for it. They're like, whoa, I can't believe it. We should do something, <laughs> you know? Cause everybody's living on a, on a pillow right now, you know? And so when you go out into the real world and hear a joke about fucked up shit, it's, it's heavy, it's like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. And you can't pick what a comic says. Mm. Everything yeah. else in life is catered now. Tinder, it's like, oh, not ugly, fat, tall, gay, whatever. Even your meal, I don't want uh, gluten, dairy, whatever. But then you go to a comedy show and it's all fresh. And you're like, whoa, I didn't, I didn't pick this, but. And you don't have control. You right? don't have control, they like control. These people complain, they like control. And we've always had these people. Sure. But it definitely has upped. Yeah. Well, we've never given them a megaphone before. That's the uh -huh. difference, right? That too. Yeah. And not only do we, they not have a megaphone, but now we listen. Yeah. We cater to that one right. queef yeah. who was upset <laughs> about the wheelchair joke. Yeah. And like, I've seen stuff where they're like, no fat jokes. And a guy's like, I'm 400 pounds. My whole act is fat jokes. And they're like, yeah, but and he's like, so now you're trying to be progressive and a good guy, but you're telling me what I can't say, mm. what makes me feel better, how I get over my pain. This is how I relieve, you know? I feel better with, with the jokes. And they're like, yeah, it's no good. And it's like, so you're like a dictator. Like I can't do my own fat, this is my act. Uh, I just heard Mark Norman was just here. I can still feel his, hey, 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 comedy. <laughs> what, are, what are we you're doing? You're gay, you're gay. <laughs> is that why this is, the tear's all torn up because yeah. he moves around. What are we doing? <laughs> I love Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark's great. Uh, but the, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on is obviously this situation with you and, and a potential agent manager um, where you were about to get signed. They they said they really liked you. And then they were like, we can't work with you because you're a white guy. Yeah, and they're going to use this clip because the, it is about 100 degrees in here and I'm sweating. <laughs> yeah. So I'm picturing in a year when we're in court, they're going to cut to this clip and go, look at him, he's sweating through it. He's yeah. probably lying about all of it. Uh Yes, yes. So what happened? So what happened? I, this has been happening for about 10 years. Every once in a while, a casting director would say, hey, you know, I want to submit you for this job, but we're not really doing the white guy thing right now. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, that's interesting. And it, it happened more and more frequently. I, I'd be booked on a podcast, get a text, hey, not the best time to have a white guy on. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, guy. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, yeah, you guys weren't even famous yet, so, <laughs> <Some> assholes. <laughs> anyway, back to the story. Back to the lawsuit. Right, for, for, eight, for, for 10 years, you've noticed that every now and again you apply for something, you know, and they're like, eh, we're not doing the white guy thing at the yeah. moment. Yep, constantly. One of the biggest jobs I, I actually got, I won't mention it, but... Uh, it was a casting director who I knew personally. She was a fan of mine. Um, and she, they, them, those, I don't want to, got to be careful there too. Uh, and she wrote to me, she said, I probably shouldn't submit white guys for this, but I have a feeling you're a perfect fit. So I'm going to sneak you in. And again, I mean, to look at that, then I start to feel like, well, I, I, I don't deserve it. Why? It, the the job had nothing to do with race or gender or anything. Mm -hmm. And I booked the job. And every day I went and I did feel a little bit like, am I stealing this from somebody because of the way she presented it? Um, so yeah, it, it just happened more and more. And then I had an agent bring me in, big agent in New York. He goes, why aren't you on SNL? Every year around 
two months before SNL, people would bring me in and go, why aren't you on SNL? Why aren't you famous? And I'm like, well, if you, you, know, if you want to help me out, mm. that'd be great. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have Lauren's WhatsApp. <laughs> so a few months later, radio silence, and I, I emailed. I said, what's, what's going on? No auditions, nothing. And he wrote back, and I quote, tough out there for white dudes. And then they, they removed me from the roster. I got an email that said, you've been removed. So I was, I was done. Are you tired of using bulky old wallets, giving you a bulge where you don't want it to be? My old wallet was massive, so it brought all the ladies to the yard, which was a huge distraction and got in the way of my esteemed work on trigonometry. Ridge wallets have an incredible solution for you. This is mine, sleek, stylish, and with an industrial look to it. It can fit 12 cards with cash on the back using a clip like this one or a strap. We've got one for the whole team. I've got one, Francis has one, even our producer Anton has one, but he's from Liverpool, so he flogged his on the black market. The great thing about Ridge is that they give you a lifetime guarantee, which means if you want, you can have only one wallet for the rest of your life. Ridge are so confident in the quality of their product, they will give you 45 days to test drive their wallets. That means you can get the wallet, use it, and if you don't like it, you can return it within 45 days. Because Ridge are such great guys, they're gonna give you 10% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to ridge.com forward slash trigger. That's ridge.com forward slash trigger and use our special code, which is of course, trigger. So then I, I just stopped uh, pursuing agents and managers for a while, started making my own stuff. This agent um, that I am suing, or manager rather, reached out and said, we love you. We want to get you auditions for Curb Your Enthusiasm, all this stuff. And um, said, great. A few months later, they reach out, said, we want, to call, we want to get you on the phone. So I'm sitting there like, all right, here mm -hmm. we go. Mm -hmm. Finally, it's all, it's all happening. And he goes, ah, we, we, we hit a snag. We really love you. We think you're a star but we're not taking white guys. And I was just like, what the f you know, been at this for 15 years. Not that I deserve anything, you know? If I went my whole career without getting booked on something, but I at least had the opportunity to audition, I'd feel okay about that. But th what's happening now is they're removing certain races from even having the opportunity to compete. And that's what a manager or an agent is. They get you the opportunity to compete that you otherwise can't unless you have, you know, a big YouTube show like you guys. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I'm sitting there and I remembered my therapist. Uh, I was dating a quite mentally unstable woman at the time. And he said, you need to start recording conversations if anything comes up because you don't want to be accused of the million things you can be accused of. And so I hit record. I said, can you say that one, one more time? You know, you like me, yeah, you think I'm a star, yeah, but you won't work with me because I'm white. And I was like, can you say it a little slower? <laughs> a little slower. <laughs> and uh, I said, is that company policy? And he said, uh, yeah, it is. And so, you know, I, I hung up and I was crushed, you know. I want to I sit here and pretend like I, I, it didn't bother me, but I cried. You know, it was like this the little kid when their balloon is just, you know, getting taken away into the sky. It's like I saw my career just, I tried everything. You know, I, I worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I do all the shows. I, I've been making sketches. And I just thought without this gatekeeper, I'm not going to make it. And so um, I didn't just go out and sue them. I mean, I worked with my therapist for for months on this and, and uh, decided to to finally pursue it. Because I thought it'll kill me if I don't. Mm. Yeah, I was I was losing my mind. I was Francis, I know you want to jump in, and I just want to finish this one yeah. thing real quick, and then f have at it. I actually have to go right. After <laughs> that, so. We'll just cut it there. Yeah. Yeah. No, but uh, the reason I uh, the thing I wanted to say before Francis, you take over, is this: when I saw the story that this had happened with you, mm -hmm. it kind of made me laugh. You know why? Because you're racist. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I hate white people. <laughs> uh, in the UK. That's no longer racist, mate. Yeah, that's, oh, that's, yeah, that's progressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but in the UK, this is going on all the time. Yeah. I had, I remember an incident where I, I had, someone was not racist to me in the street, right? And that day I got home, 
what, and was, I got an what was the race? Was it white or was no, it? No, no, it was dark. Oh, because right. oh. you, you, you're right. Yeah, I, I, can, I can go either way. This <laughs> yeah. is my point, right? Same day, I get home that evening, I get an email from a promoter saying, I'm sorry, we're going to have to change your dates because there's too many white people on the bill. So I've just been, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Right? <laughs> and Francis will tell you as well. This is like, it would never occur to anyone on the UK comedy scene to sue a manager or, or an agent who'd said that. Yeah. Because it's, it's just taken for granted now. It's normal. It's normal. It's beyond normal. It's so normal that they're comfortable saying it, even with a little laugh. You know, I, I believe he had a little giggle, you know. <laughs> you know, the pendulum will swing back and I'm going, the pendulum is broken out of the fucking clock <laughs> and it's just like <laughs> slamming everyone in the head. I don't want to hear the pendulum analogy, you know. So we can start with uh, the pandemic era aid policies that have been distributed on race. So there's the American Rescue Plan, which was a $2 trillion bailout at the height of the pandemic in 2021 to help Americans that were struggling, to help mm -hmm. businesses. You know. Part of that was $28 billion for restaurants that were going out of business every day. And the program was done in such a way that anyone not white was put to the front of the line automatically in so-called priority groups. If you're white, um, it took a lot more work uh, to get into that category. Um, there was $4 billion of aid for farmers with debt, only if you were non-white. Zero of that money was available to you if you were a white farmer with debt. And there was zero money in the bill available to you in general, right? So it was just a pot of money only for non-white farmers. Um, and again, if you are, if you're a white restaurant owner or a white struggling farmer that loses their farm in the context of a recession, where people are losing their businesses every day, and your business is your life, mm -hmm. if that's what you're. absolutely, you are never going to forgive that you were not treated on the basis of need, but you were treated on the basis of race, just like black people in America have not forgotten redlining, Jim Crow. Um, you know, convict leasing, uh, all of these policies that affected black Americans have not been forgotten and in many cases have not been forgiven. And we should not expect that these kinds of things are going to be forgotten or forgiven mm. and uh, certainly not going to be excused on the basis of paying for other people's sins. Mm. The thing that I find completely baffling when you were, when you were talking about this and when you're talking about it now, I just think, the people who come up with these ideas, do they not realize this really pisses people off, quite rightly, and there will be a backlash? Yeah, they, it's interesting. I think, I think many people are able to um, ignore, the, ignore the backlash in two ways. So in, in, in one way, they will just actually not look at it, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of... A lot of, I think, top Democrat party operatives would not actually like these policies if they look them in the face. It's just they kind of sweep it under the rug. They don't report about it. They don't watch the Tucker Carlson segment about it because why would they watch that? Mm -hmm. And they soft pedal it. If you bring it up, they say, oh, it, it wasn't really that. It was something softer. They use the language the Orwellian euphemisms of priority group and historically disadvantaged group, um, which, you know, all of which is intended to soften the truth, which is that you gave people money, limited money, because of the race that they happened to be born into, and you denied it to others on the basis of race, period. And so there's that, but then there's also, um, the way this will be reported on is the groups that are part of the backlash. Well, they're MAGA-backed groups, mm. right? So there's a MAGA-backed lawsuit against the farmer bill, right? When you read this in the New York Times, they will make sure to front load for you and therefore prime prime you as a reader. So like, I, like, I don't like MAGA. I don't like Trump. I voted against him twice. So when I read that it's a MAGA-backed lawsuit, that's priming me to say, oh, well, we, we, their anger doesn't count. We're a bunch of racists being racist. They're again. a bunch of racists being racist, exactly. Whereas if you were to meet one of these people, a white restaurant owner struggling, 
um, who may have had no, you know, you may assume this person had quote unquote white privilege or whatever, but you know nothing about this person's background. Like he might, he might have struggled just as much or more than a black restaurant, any given black restaurant owner. Um, and, and you meet him and you look in his eyes and you go to his restaurant and, and you see that this person was reported on as basically a, a quote angry white guy. Mm -hmm. In a way that was intended to to let you dismiss his anger as invalid. I mean, you know. And by the way, what was the civil rights movement but a long overdue backlash to Jim Crow laws? That's what it was. So the the language of backlash, I think, is it's intended to make you feel that this is that that people are reacting, that they're coming from a place of anger that's invalid. And I, I think it should that anger should be seen as a, a, a um, like a perfectly predictable consequence of people being discriminated against, right. and the discrimination should stop. Right. Well, this is what I was going to ask you about because um, I, I talk about it in my book uh, about one experience that I had in the UK when I was invited to participate in a in a TV discussion of these similar issues. Um, and afterwards, one of the it was a panel of several people. And afterwards, one of the presenters during the ad break uh, looked at me and they went, "I'm so glad there weren't any white British people here to be involved in this conversation." Mm -hmm. And I was completely stunned by this. And it was only when I got home later I was like, "Why would they say that? Like they know I don't agree with this. Imagine I recorded that and I put that out or whatever, right?" Um, and then it was only when I got home later that I realized this is normal to these people. This way of thinking is normal now. The homeless situation in this, in this state is out of control. The last time I was here was 2007, and what I've seen just driving about in the short time that I've been here, I found genuinely shocking. Well, there's, so there's an, another thing which is sort of the beginning of the end of a civilization, which is California has in very intense rules for people who pay taxes and play by the rules. I mean, insane uh, amount of regulation red tape. But conversely, if you do not want to pay taxes or you can then construct yourself a, a shelter on the side of the freeway and you will be left alone. So basically it's this. We have some of the most stringent building codes and they're up your ass every step of the way. So if you wanna, you own a home and you wanna build a gazebo in your backyard, that's a two year permit situation <laughs> there. But if you'd like to not pay taxes or property taxes and just build a plywood home in the park, you will be left alone. And that's why we have over-regulated for those who are playing by the rules and almost zero regulation for anyone who wants to just slam drugs and live in the street. And why is that? What's the philosophy behind that from, from the powers that be? I, there's, a, there's a kind of a weird system, which is like, you have money, you can afford a home. You know, the, that homeless person is sort of noble and needs our help and we're gonna punch up, we're not gonna punch down and we'll leave him alone. I, I chronicled this in a, a book I wrote a few years ago, which is I started noticing there's a street, it's called Forest Lawn Drive and it goes by the cemetery and it's three miles from here. And so there's a big cemetery there. And so on one side of the street, you have a lot of poor Latino people who go down to the flower mart. Latinx, they, please, Adam. Latinx, <laughs> and they buy Latinx. <laughs> and they buy, it's the most obnoxious thing ever. So they buy flowers and then they sell them cheaply to people that are going to visit Nana, who died four years ago. And, and so on one side of the street, you have and it's a mess, like the boxes and the trash and everything on one side of the street. And they're just running a, a bootleg flower shop from the street. They're just street vendors, you know. And street vendors, street vendors everywhere here, as you guys probably know. Okay, on the other side of the street, there's a cop. 
and the cops on a motorcycle and he's backed up the driveway to the Jewish cemetery and he's got his radar gun out. He's given tickets to taxpayers and soccer moms that are going five miles an hour too fast down Forest Lawn Drive. The other side of the street is illegal activity going on. And first off, they're not paying taxes. Nothing's permitted. They don't have a business license. They're undercutting the flower store up the street who has to pay insurance and, and all the expenses that are incurred with running a business in Los Angeles. Those people operate with impunity and our government is handing out tickets to the soccer mom who's driving her kid to school. I noticed that about 10 years ago and I was like, something's broken here. You either have to bust both people or you gotta let the soccer mom go too. And so we start, that's the path, that's a progressive path. I don't know, what, I don't know what's considered compassionate about letting people just sort of die in the streets or sell their goods in the streets or all cash under the tail. It's some compassion. We also have a racial thing too, because those are Hispanic people on that side of the street. And if you come down on them, then that's going to be like a bad optic. We're, we're a mess. We don't know what I, I, I went out on a boat with a guy who ran the staple center, which is now, I don't know, the crypto center or whatever it is. And I said to him, I, I walked out of a Lakers game a couple of years ago with my son. It was besieged with people with makeshift hot dog carts and propane tanks just selling street food. But I said, it was all on your property. It's all on the Staples Center. It wasn't, it was right by, right, there's the door. Or you should walk out of the venue. It's like you bang into a guy that, he pulled out his phone and he showed me a picture of one of those carts with a giant cockroach cooking on it. And he said, <laughs> he said, we hate it. We hate it. Well, what can you do? I said, well, what can you do? You're, you're inside charging 14 bucks for a hot dog. These guys are charging two bucks for a hot dog. There's no permit. There's no license. They're dealing with food. There's no health ordinance or something. They're on your property. They're just selling. He said, oh yeah, they, they load them up in vans and they bring them out, you know, and they're all cooking out front there. I said, go to the city council. You guys are one of the biggest tax payers and you, you took downtown and resurrected it by building the Staples Center. You gotta be one of the biggest taxpayers and employers in the city. Go down to the commission, the city council, tell them, clean this shit up. We don't want this stuff out of it. He goes, I don't wanna get into trouble. What? That's the way those exact words to me. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna get into, I don't, I don't need that kind of trouble. What, what does that mean, Adam? I, 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 it just means if he, he as the taxpayer who runs the Staples Center, if he goes to the city council and says, I want you to get these people off of my whatever, they'll go after him. That's, I mean, we did the same with COVID. It's like, that's that's just where we're at. That's why people are leaving. Have you, and this is why I was gonna ask you, because when we were in Austin, we, we did Joe Rogan's show, and one of the things he's trying to do is get a bunch of people down there, sort of like a building new scene. Have you ever thought of moving? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't. No, and that's why I'm a good interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> we referenced it at the start of the interview. One of my, our favorite routines of yours is the white privilege routine. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's brilliant, and, and I think the reason it hits is, look, it's wonderfully funny, let's just say that first of all. But I think the reason it hits is because you're telling the truth. Yeah. So how did step us, guide us through, how did, you, how did you make that happen? How did you? Well, they didn't like, you know, sometimes like poor, poor white people get left out of like the, the poverty conversation, I feel like sometimes maybe. It's hard to like, it's kind of shit. Sometimes you're like, if you're white, right? And I'm Polish and Nicaraguan, right? And, but if you are white or looked at as a white, you know, whitey, honky, wiggers, whatever they call them, you know? Um, I don't know what they call them in, what do you guys call them? Chavs. Chavs, chavs. Yeah. yeah. Couple fucking, you know, little chavs, right? Yeah. At AR. Um, <laughs> if you are chavs or just regular white people, poor white people, mm -hmm. then yeah, I felt like a lot of times um, when people think of like poor, they think of just, uh, ethnicities first a lot yeah. of times, you know? Right. And so 
and you always feel bad anyway because white people, you're just supposed to have money, right? So yeah. automatically out of the gate, you're like, how the fuck do we not have a little bit more money than this, right? <laughs> right, right. If you've right. had a couple generations and you've shown up in the, you know, in the correct uniform, yeah. how would you not have a bit more of a, you know, treasure chest, yeah. to, you know, but, yeah. but, you know, that's what you get born into. And so that's that. And, uh, and yeah, it kind of feels like you don't really get a voice sometimes, you know? Um, and then, yeah, so I think that was part of my thing. It was like, I'm, I ride the same bus as the poor black kids, the poor, we only had black and white in our town. Yeah. But like, you know, when people think of, um, when people think of, yeah, helping like, sometimes they, they would miss us. You know, mm. it would feel like sometimes. And now also, maybe that's just a feeling and maybe that's not even the reality, but it was my perception sometimes, you know. I wasn't angry at black people for it. I just was like, well, this is my truth, you know. Right. And sometimes yeah. it feels like uh, they don't know where to put that truth in like a mainstream space. Right. It doesn't fit that if you're not, if you're poor and white and not a racist person or, you know, somebody who's mating with their, you know, siblings or whatever, then you, um, they don't, it's almost like, yeah, we're, yeah, like you don't exist, but you do. Right. And there's a lot of you, you know. Yeah. Hey Francis, do you like locals? I live in London, mate, so obviously not. The only pleasure I get from the locals is when we share an intimate moment as we watch a Japanese tourist get trapped in a tube door. That is good. But I wasn't talking about the locals, I was talking about our community on locals. You mean the one where you get phenomenal behind the scenes content when you like your space we speak, we speak. When you get to ask incredible guests like Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein, Bill Burr, Sam Harris, Adam Carolla, Heather Hying, and others your questions? Not just that, you can get supporter-only benefits like trigonometry mugs, monthly calls with our other top supporters, and even a regular meal with me and Francis. You also get phenomenal behind-the-scenes footage of our trip to America, where we met a whole host of incredible guests and gave ourselves terminal indigestion. We're also starting to do monthly giveaways for locals only. The first one will be signed copies of Andrew Doyle's new book. Plus, you get access to an incredible community of like-minded people who share memes, have fun conversations, and most importantly, you get to make new friends. You can support us with as little as $7 or about five pounds a month, or give us more for the higher tier benefits. Go to Trigonometry dot locals dot com go to trigonometry dot locals dot com and support the show do you really want to live in a country where you have a digital public square which in my opinion twitter is we can disagree about that if you want but that's my opinion it's a digital public square and you have a company that has clearly one-sided enforcement i I hear what you're saying about de delegitimizing the electoral process that Trump did, right. and I was concerned about that. I think you can't question the system in that way. But when you see that he gets banned and then a story about Hunter Biden gets banned, mm. that under the guise of it being Russian disinformation, we later learn it wasn't Russian disinformation, right. that to a lot of people seems like, you know, I said it when we were talking to Joe Rogan, it's putting your hand on the scales yeah. in favor oh, yeah. of one side in the digital public square, you add that to the banning of Trump and lots of other people being banned from one side predominantly. Right. Is that is that the world you wanna live in where one team gets to just ban people it disagrees with off the platform, it gets to pretend that things that are true are not true, it gets to shut down the sharing of information with people who want to make their own democratic choice? Well, it's a, it's a hard question and there are pieces of the question that are individually hard. It's like the Hunter Biden laptop story is something that I still don't have a, a full opinion about. I actually don't know what we should have done about that. I mean, so I, so I see the reason, I see both sides of, of it. I, I can argue either side of it. The, the, so let's leave that piece aside. 
the bias on the platform. So, so either Twitter is a company that can do what it wants, right? It can have its own terms of service. It can change its policies. It can, it can change. You know, it can decide to. You know, it, it can have a point of view or not, right? Or we have to seize it as some kind of, you know, crucial piece of public infrastructure that has to, to Do you not think that it is a terms. crucial piece of public infrastructure? I think, I think people who are addicted to Twitter feel <laughs> it is, <laughs> right? Most, you know, and, and I think it's, you know, I don't think it should, should be. Um, and it's, it's odd to say that it's just so, it's, it, first of all, it's just, I mean, Facebook is much, much, much bigger, right? It's just that we have a lot of smart people, journalists, uh, brands, uh, political people focus, concentrated on Twitter. So Twitter moves the the conversation more than Facebook does, but it's 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 the scale of it is much smaller. Um, I don't know. I just feel like people can start their own companies, which they have, right? So they can start competitors at Twitter. There are many people who you know Twitter is not. It's, it's still a failing business, right? It's mm -hmm. like it's not. It doesn't work really. I um, mean, Facebook is is a much better business. Um, there's nothing stopping Facebook from becoming stickier for intellectuals and journalists and, 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 and attracting more of the conversation over there. Um, I don't know. It's just it's it's an extreme move to say you you can't you can't be biased, right? Like who's who's going to say that? But behind behind the saying of that is a law in the end. And there, and therefore, it's a gun. Therefore, it's 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 jail time for the person who wants to keep breaking the law, right? So, like, just imagine, imagine if Twitter, the Twitter board, you know, like, what you, everyone gets what they want. You know, everyone who's who's of this opinion gets mm -hmm. what they want. You just we're gonna we're gonna come in and 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 enforce something like um, uh, a zero bias state in Twitter, insofar as that's possible. And if the if the employees and the board just say, you know, sorry, we we have a point of view. We want we want to have we we don't like these people and we like these people. Um, what so now? You just break up the company. You just say, you, you, you know, I mean, I I thought what I thought it should have happened with Twitter is I thought Jack Dorsey should have deleted it. I mean, I literally thought he should would have got the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> had he just <laughs> at a certain point deleted it, right? Um, but. Uh, yeah, I don't. So, in any case, well, should there should they be forced to be impartial? I'm very skeptical th of that. Should they be cajoled by unhappy people like yourselves or like you know the uh, um, yeah, the Trump fans to um, to I'm behave just putting better? A yeah, here, Sam. I mean, I think so. Yeah, yes, I think if they were going to be imp the first thing to admit is it may be impossible to do this impeccably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like the, in, until we have, you know, perfect artificial intelligence, it's just going to be impossible to be truly consistent with your terms of service because you're always going to be able to find the example of the thing that was not appropriately moderated. Yes, uh, but if we all know that if that laptop was Donald Trump's junior, oh yeah, this would be 100%. treated. That's yeah. that's all I'm asking. Oh yeah, about, well, right? so, so, but that's a, so. Let's take that piece. Um, I think it was totally appropriate to view Trump in a to be existing in a in a domain that was orthogonal to partisan politics. I my criticism of Trump is totally nonpartisan. Right there is absent. There's literally nothing I say about Trump that I could say about any other Republican. Right, and I think Liz Cheney is a total hero. Right, so so. And I don't agree with her politics at all, right? Like Liz Cheney is a religious maniac by my lights, right? And in in that sense, kind of a terrifying political figure, like 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 that, like the the old me who you know was just worried about the Christian theocracy in, in the United States, um, would have just re revolted at everything she would attempt to implement as a politician, but at this moment. She's, you know, she has no bigger fan than me because of how she's dealing with the Trump phenomenon. The Trump phenomenon is not a matter of political partisanship. He, he is a, he is just a sui generis uh, phenomenon. And it's, 
again, it's, it's, it's analogous to having elected Alex Jones president of the United States. It's, it's a, it's a, it's not a matter of his, like, I probably agree with half of his policies or more than half of his policies. It's not a matter of policy. It's a matter of having someone who's totally unfit to have power be given more power than any person in a generation. And, and he's unfit for, in every possible way. It's like, it's not, it's not that he's just got a few screws loose. Like, every screw is loose. Every screw that you would want totally cranked down is loose or non-existent in him. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, I mean, that, that's my argument. So, like, so, so my argument is that it was appropriate for Twitter and the heads of big tech and, journal, and the heads of journalistic organizations to feel that they were in the presence of something like a, a once in a lifetime moral emergency, right? Whereas this is not the same thing as not liking George Bush, you know, or not liking John McCain or not liking Mitt Romney for their politics. This was, here's a guy who is capable of anything, right? He's not, he's not ideological, but he's, again, he's, he's a black hole of selfishness, right? He's, he's, he's just, and so there's no telling what he's going to do. Um, and we cannot afford to have four more years with this guy, right? And, and, and so, um, so what, what should well-intentioned people do who have a lot of power in these various ways? You know, you're running the New York Times, you're running CNN, you're running Twitter, what should they conspire to do? Admit that it's their those fault. Conditions? <laughs> what was Admit that? that Trump is their fault. And look, that, I'm well, the, someone from oh, the left. Absolutely. So. That, that's, well, no, no that, that's the perverse thing. It, it's totally their fault. He, I mean, CNN, CNN gave us Trump. Right? Yeah. Well, that, no, before CNN gave us Trump, Mark Burnett gave us Trump. I mean, that is, if, if there's one person who could have not done what he did and, and uh, could have closed the door to this whole phenomenon, it, it was Mark Burnett. Um, but yeah, no. So by giving him the attention, you know, but he was he was great ratings, you know, for a year for the whole run up to to the twenty sixteen election. Oh yeah, no, there no one has clean hands here. But it, at the eleventh hour, when it's when, who knows how this election is going to go? Who know who knows what the capacity for, you know, disinformation at the last minute to to tip the balance is. Then what do you do with the Hunter Biden laptop story when we already know, we, we know how this played out in 2016 with the Hillary Clinton email, you know, press conference where, where Comey in, 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 a, in an abundance of scrupulosity felt like he had to come before the cameras, I think 10 days out from the election and say, you know, we've, we're going to open up this, this investigation again because we've got Anthony Weiner's laptop, uh, we could see, I mean, again, her failure to become president was overdetermined. She was a, an appallingly bad candidate. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of just tracking the poll numbers, you could, like, that was, that was the killing blow to her candidacy, right? That, that final moment. And this was, a, this was a highly analogous situation. This was, we're going to open up this laptop from hell, and the n news cycle for who knows how long is going to be just... A, just the, the, conceivably just a nuclear bomb of a, an October, October surprise. And we're going to get four more years of Trump if we actually give this a fair hearing. But Sam. But you can't do that, Sam, surely. You've got to realize that you've got to be fair. <laughs> and number, the thing that I want to We're talk, all equal before the law. Yeah. And aren't then, we? And the other this thing, isn't the law. But the, I know this it's isn't not the law. law. But yeah. if, this is, if you accept my, my supposition that this is the public square, then it is the law. It is, if it is the public square, then it is law. Now, you're arguing it's not the public square, which is fair enough. Yeah. Right? That's right. fine. Yeah, but no. why don't we move on? Because I think we, we've done enough. Yeah, sure. Yeah. He's of sucked course. up a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he got, always, a, he's he got a habit of yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I'll just say, just finally, I, I do, th I, again, it's like a coin toss for me, the Hunter mm -hmm. Biden laptop thing. Because I, I do understand how corrosive it is for an institution like the, the New York Times to show obvious bias and inconsistency and dishonesty in how they, because like they couldn't even frame it honestly. It's not like, <laughs> it, it's not like, it's like the way I would frame it is, uh, 
listen, I don't care what's in Hunter Biden's. I mean, Hunter Biden, at that point, Hunter Biden literally could have had, had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared, right? It's like, it's, there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden, right? It's not, it's like, it's not Joe Biden. But even if Joe, like even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is, like if, you, if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and, and understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else, right, or China, it is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. It's like, it's like, it's like a firefly to the sun, right? I mean, like there, there's just, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even stack up against Trump University, right? Trump University as a story is worse than anything that could be in, in Hunter Biden's laptop, in my view, right? Now that's not, that doesn't answer the people who say it's still completely unfair to not have looked at the laptop in a timely way and to have shut down the, you know, the New York Post's Twitter account. Like that, that's a, just a conspiracy, that's a left-wing conspiracy to deny the presidency to Donald Trump. Absolutely it was, absolutely, right? But I think it was warranted. Right, and I'm, and again, it's a coin toss as to whether or not Sam, I'm sorry. that particular piece. I'm, I'm really yeah. sorry. I, I was the one that said we should move yeah, on, yeah. but you've just oh, said yeah. something I really struggle with. It. There, which is the you kid, support the, kid, the, kid, the kids in the basement. You no no <laughs> fuck yeah. the kids in the yeah. basement. I'm interested yeah. in democracy. You're saying you are content with a left wing conspiracy to prevent somebody being democratically reelected as president. Well, no, I'm, I'm content. Well, so it's, but the thing is, it's just not left wing, right? So Liz Cheney is not left wing. Right. Liz Cheney is doing everything in her power. You're conspiracy to prevent somebody no, being democratically it's not a, No, but there's nothing, conspiracy, it's not, it, it was a conspiracy out in the open, it does, but it doesn't matter if it was, a, it doesn't matter what part's conspiracy, what part's out in the open. I mean, I think it's like, if people get together and talk, and talk about what should we do with, about this phenomenon, you know, if, if it's like, if there, if there was an asteroid hurtling toward Earth and, and we got in a room together with all of our friends and had a conversation about what we could do to deflect its course, right? Is that a conspiracy? You know, like some of that conversation would be in public, some of it would be in private. We have a massive problem. We have an existential threat, right? Politically speaking, I consider Trump an existential threat to our democracy, right? Now, it's not, he's not gonna destroy the world very well, likely. If he destroyed but, democracy in the process of protecting democracy. No, that, but that doesn't destroy, no, our, our I'm not, what I'm not suggesting, at no point was I suggesting we should stuff ballots no, or, or, no. or actually break the machinery of democracy. But the all, pol political opinion is already being just, just completely inundated with misinformation, biased takes, half-truths, mm -hmm. and outright lies, right? Like, and, and, yeah. Or just the amplification of, of bad or misleading information based on you know, the algorithm, right? Um, so that's, it's like, it's, it's already just an abattoir of opinion, right? And now the question is, you know, what can you do with your own biases and your own, the, the, the uh, to, 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 to get the outcome you think is actually better, not just for yourself personally, but for the world, right? So like, I have like, it is, I'm completely unconflicted in, in the claim that a tr that a, a first Trump term was bad and a second Trump term would be bad, and it literally doesn't matter what was uh, what what else was on the the menu. Like literally, uh, pick a pick a, a random American better than Trump in the in the Oval Office. Like the the, the likelihood that you're going to get someone who's worse than Trump, given given what I consider that the, is bad about Trump, is I mean it's. It's on the order of one in a million, right? Like you're just not, you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get worse than Trump if you pick at random. And, you know, Hillary Clinton for all of her flaws was not worse than Trump. Joe Biden, for all, Joe Biden, we could have known Joe Biden was gonna just be comatose in office, not worse than Trump, right? Um, Kamala Harris, not worse, like, like it's all, and, and, and again, it's not just a, a marginal call. It's just, these are people who are normal politicians who are so much more constrained by predictable machinery, right? There's, there's, like, there's, there's such less of an opportunity there to destroy institutions that we have to rely on, 
right? If, with, with any of those people in charge, including a random person in charge, a random person who's going to be terrified at the responsibility of the office and default to expert opinion, you know, uh, across the board. Um, no, Trump is, again, Trump is an Alex Jones level figure for me. And, okay. and okay. so, you know, it's, it's analogous, like a smaller problem is to just for some billionaire to buy the New York Times and give it to Alex Jones to run, right? That would be an enormous, that would be a catastrophic loss and mistake, but that's a smaller problem than getting Trump reelected. What should we know? What should people understand about this regime that we've been doing business with? What are some of the things that have been happening that a lot of, a lot of outlets in the West are just not covering? Well, okay, so the, the obvious one is the organ harvesting. Uh, you know, I, I call it murder for organs industry. Um, uh, more commonly, it's called the forced organ harvesting reality in China. It's the only place in the world where it's state sanctioned, uh, if not state directed. You know, there's some debate about that among the people that are studying this. Um, but to make a long story short, well, actually, why don't, I'll, I'll tell a bit of a story, okay? I believe it was in 2006 or 2005 or 2006. Um, and is an Israeli transplant doctor named Jacob Levy um, had a patient. And Israel has this, has this policy where if you need to get a trans, life-saving transplant, you can go out of country, the state pays for that, okay? Um, he, he, his patient tells him, I'm going to China, I'm going to get this transplant, heart transplant, I'm going to get it in two weeks. And Jacob is, as a transplant surgeon, by the way, head of the Israeli Transplant Association also, mm -hmm. he's shocked and stunned. And he understands immediately that there's no ethical way that this could happen because, see, a heart transplant is something that you can't actually schedule because you would have to know when someone's going to be dead. And the only way you can really know when someone's going to be dead to give that heart is to make them so, okay? So, you know, he's kind of stunned by this. The guy goes, comes back, and basically, he's got the transplant. Later, there's complications. That's a, a different story. But Jacob takes the time. And in a couple of years, the Israeli parliament has adopted a law that says, if you go to China to get a transplant, we will not pay for it. One of the few countries to this day, by the way, that's adopted such a law. It's very, very interesting. But this is at this point, we already knew that something terrible is happening. Uh, two Canadian human rights, uh, two Canadian lawyers, uh, uh, David Kilgore, they call them the two Davids, David Kilgore, David Maitis, they actually looked at the body of evidence that was available at the time in 2006. They found, yes, definitely there's an industry in China, the murder for organs industry. And the most likely people that are being used for it are the Falun Gong. Why the Falun Gong? Why? Because they're, there's millions of them in the labor camps. They're a group that's targeted for eradication, so it's easy, much easier for people to do things like this, right? Murder for organs and so forth. So, and I remember I interviewed David Kilgore back in 2006 about this. He had he had spoken with a guy who had gone to China and got a kidney transplant. They had fitted him with eight. He had a rare antibody condition. They had fitted him with eight separate kidneys on two separate trips. The eighth one was the one that took because the basically the antibody situation wasn't an issue for that one. So you can just imagine how many people likely lost their lives along the way to get to that one transplant. Um, more recently, okay, and this is this is, I think, what you could call the 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 best smoking gun evidence that exists. But Jacob, I'll go back to Jacob Levy, him and a and a journalist, uh, 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 Matthew Robertson. They put to, they basically looked at all these Chinese officially published Chinese studies in medical journals, and they found through looking at protocols very carefully, 71 instances in the published literature where people had been killed by heart extraction. Okay, the, the, the cause of death was certainly their heart removal of a heart. And they've just, they published this in the American Journal of Transplantation recently. So, you know, it's been this quest, so to speak, since that time to try to convince people that this is really something that's actually happening for starters. And, you know, it's really only, I think, this year that I, I hear kind of broad acceptance. And there's been a lot of hurdles along and the way. And give everybody yeah. a sense of the scale of what's happening. How many people do you think are likely to have gone through this? I just had a conversation with Ethan Gutman maybe a couple of weeks ago. Ethan was, I think, the 
premier field researcher on this issue. He's lived in Falun Gong communities and in Uyghur communities. This shifted later, by the way, into the Uyghur communities as another extremely vulnerable, vulnerable group to be used for this practice. But um, the, the estimate, a credible estimate since about 2002 is 60 to 100,000 transplants a year. And then if you, and then I said, well, that, that would be, could be more than a million people. And he, Ethan said, no, 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 Jan, that's an overestimate because, the, because of ECMO technology. So ECMO is a type of machine that allows you to replace the heart and lungs. It's often used when people need very complicated surgeries and they, you know, maybe around those organs or something like this. So around 2007, 2008, ECMO technology started being used. So you could conceivably, because this is important to know, you can only really transplant from a body that's brain dead and body alive. You can't transplant from cadavers. So it's, it, it, there's limited time frame, right? This gives you apparently 24, according to Ethan, another 24 hours. So you could do multiple transplants that match tissue and, and, and blood and all this, all this. So ultimately, his estimate, and I think, and he's very conservative in his estimates, is about half a million people. But the, the thing that struck me was I was looking at the black, if you're familiar with the Black Book of Communism, right? That uh, chronicles the, the ver- deaths of various communist regimes. This, you know, is... A significant just this organ harvesting regime. Let's take that million of five hundred thousand. That roll, number of five hundred thousand people, five hundred thousand people killed for organs in China, is a significant number in the list of the Black Book. I mean, alone, never mind the Great Leap Forward, never mind the Cultural Revolution, never mind you know what happened in the Soviet Union. So, yeah, it's been it's been pretty nuts. Uh, so I left. I was working at a, a place called Fair. And I left that job because I wanted to go full-time on my substack to tackle the gender sex denials and stuff. Because to me, that's just, it's like the eye of the storm. It's the, the craziest stuff. That's where I want to focus all my attention. Um, but then that, that's kind of a scary thing because then I'm completely reliant on payment processors. I'm, uh, substack uses Stripe. They're pretty good. Um, They've, they've kind of routinely come out pro-free speech and things like that. Um, but I was also using PayPal to solicit donations of people. If they didn't want to just subscribe to my Substack, but they wanted to give me donations directly, monthly, one-time donations or whatever, they could do so through PayPal. Um, so I had received an email from PayPal just out of the blue, just saying you can no longer use PayPal. I think that was the, the subject line. And I thought this was had to be completely, oh, that maybe maybe my credit card is not working or I need to update something. Uh, and then going through, you know, trying to, to turn it back on, well, there, every, everywhere I went led to like a dead end. So I called like the, the help desk, just to, something's clearly uh, <laughs> amiss here. And they said that, you know, they would put me in touch with somebody who'd be able to tell me what's going on, expect an email. Well, I never got an email. They sent me a message through the PayPal system saying that if I want to find out why my account was turned off, that I would need to submit, have an attorney submit a, a subpoena, a legal subpoena to find out. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all I know. They didn't say any reason why my account was shut down in the first place. Uh, so you, we can only imagine. They've done the same thing to Ian Miles Chung. Uh, they recently also shut down Moms for Liberty account, their PayPal account. So this is sort of a pattern that they have mm-hmm. of people that they disagree with politically on this. Um, and it puts me in a precarious position because I'm completely reliant on these systems now. I don't work for a company. I work for myself, and so I need to have a way where people can pay me, you know, directly uh, or through through some sort of system. So it's it's really kind of a scary thing where just some some intern at PayPal or maybe it's at Stripe now. I hope I hope they're as robust as I'm hoping they are. Um, but you know, just a single click. And they can just turn off my entire income. And have you been able to appeal or challenge in any way? Are you considering following the legal route? I'm considering going and actually just making them give me the reason. So doing the uh, the subpoena route. Mm-hmm. So that's sort of in the works, but um, we're not quite there yet. Uh, and then also, so it wasn't just PayPal, but I also had a, an Etsy store. You know, it wasn't like a big part of my income, but every once in a while I'd sell what, a What is Etsy? Oh, yeah. So Etsy is like this online store that people can set up their little shops. It was originally known for people selling like homemade goods, like they'd mm. knitting or something, or they'd make earrings with rocks or something like that. Sounds like it should um, be banned yeah, anyway. And, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
And then it sort of expanded more, and now you can just host, you can sell anything you want to. Okay. Shirts, mugs, a lot of people use it for that, just because it's, it's got like low fees for people who are hosting their stuff. Um, and then they sent me an email saying that I can no longer use Etsy, I'm permanently banned from Etsy. Now they did give me a reason. They said that my merchandise was, I think the wording was, supporting and glorifying hatred against protected groups. But if you actually saw the merchandise that I had on there, it was, I literally only sold three things. I had, so my, my sub stack is called Reality's Last Stand. So I had some mugs that just had the words Reality's Last Stand and they had a male and a female symbol. Mm -hmm. I had um, another logo that said Defender of Reality and it had male and female symbol. Boo. I guess these are hate symbols now. Yeah. Um, and then I had my political cartoon, the poster I gave you of the one Elon Musk tweeted out that just showed you know, how from my perception sort of the left had gone really left and the center had moved past me and now I'm perceived as being on the right. So that's, there's nothing hateful there, um, but apparently this was, was considered glorifying violence against minorities. I did try to appeal and they said, nope, we stand by our decision. Meanwhile, they do sell things that say like, you know, kill turfs. They have things that are like turf stompers and a turf is someone who like criticizes gender ideology. It stands for trans-exclusionary radical feminist, and they have things that are clearly glorifying violence mm -hmm. against those types of people. Um, but I can't sell just like a, a mug that has the name of my, my sub stack on it, apparently. A hundred years ago, how many people were confused about their gender? Like how many, how many men were going around who really thought that they were women? I'm sure there were some, like very, very small number. And they were mentally ill, it's a mental illness. And uh, if we were still a sane society, we would treat that with therapy, counseling. It's what you do for mentally ill people. You treat their minds to the best of your ability. Um, this astronomical rise, though, in transgender identification, that's obviously not uh, just mental illness. It's not something people are born with. There's something happening in the culture, clearly. Because... Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And in, because in the film, like the first half an hour was really funny. I was sitting there with the lads and we were, you know, we were laughing. We're going like, oh, this not bull saying this. I people. wasn't laughing. I saw all the trouble coming. Up. Yeah, but I was laughing because I think it, you, you exposed these elements of it and it was comically humorous. But then what was terrifying is when we saw the medical professionals, the doctors affirming this. Did you expect that? Because I certainly didn't. Yeah, I think, well, that's one thing I, I was a little bit worried about actually with, with the film before it came out is that we, we knew we were going to have this tonal shift and I don't know, is it, is it too abrupt? Is it kind of weird? And it is abrupt and weird, but at the same time, I think it's also necessary that like on the surface level, th th this is absurd. And so we laugh at absurdity, which is an appropriate response. Um, but then you go a little bit under the surface, you see there's some really sinister stuff going on. And that's when you get into the, the doctors who are... Um, encouraging, you know, who are sort of spreading this plague and doing it in, in a really intentional way. And, and doctors who I think certainly know better. And, you know, we talked to one a pediatrician in the film, uh, Forcier, who prescribes these drugs, chemical castration drugs to, to children. And um, what, what was so revolting about that, aside from just, you know, the obvious, is that when I talked to her, like she had no defense of the practice at all. She was not able to even begin to defend this, and yet she's doing it. And so that makes you think, well, if she can't defend it, then she must know that this is wrong. That's just my, you know, that, that, that's my interpretation, is that a lot of these people know what they're doing is wrong, and yet they do it anyway. Why would they do it anyway? Well, one big thing is money. There's a, there's a huge financial incentive. We get into that a little bit in the film, but you have to keep in mind, there's billions of dollars, not for one individual, but like for these industries, there's billions of dollars at stake. Um, and you think about, you know, you've got a six-year-old kid who says that, you know, six-year-old boy says he's confused about his gender. And if you were to just say to the six-year-old boy, oh, no, you're a boy, and help him to accept himself for who he is, then that's great. That's the right thing to do, but there's no money in that, right? If, on the other hand, you encourage him to go delve even deeper into that confusion, then that boy is worth thousands, if not millions of dollars to big pharma, therapists, doctors down the line. So I think there's a real financial incentive. 
And, uh, you know, we've interviewed a ton of people about this, trans people who don't agree with some elements of this ideology, uh, other people, gender critical feminists, etc. And yet I was still shocked by the second half of the movie. Were you shocked by what you found in uh, particularly with doctors and, and professors? I was, uh, yeah, that's the thing. Even when you encounter something that you already knew about intellectually, it's still shocking just to encounter it. Exactly. I mean, to, to, I knew that so-called sex change or what they call gender affirmation surgeries now, which is if a euphemism if I ever heard one, but uh, I knew that that was happening. And yet to sit across from someone who does this and hear them explain it, it's still shocking just to encounter it. And I was also shocked. There were some things I learned. Like I, b before getting into the film, making the film and researching it before we filmed it, I, I, I did not realize how young the kids are when they start them on the actual medical transition part of it. How, I, how young are they, Matt? Well, I mean, as young as, uh, as, young as 10, 11 years old when they start them on the, on the hormones and you get into puberty blockers. The surgery especially. I, I, a year and a half ago, I didn't realize that they were actually, that they really were mutilating kids. I thought that, you know, this is something that starts at the age of 18. But no, I mean, they, they chopped the breasts off of uh, 13 and 14 year old girls, even younger sometimes. I didn't, I didn't realize that. And it's, um, I think a lot of people don't, don't realize that that's happening. And uh, hopefully now they do. Does it worry you, Bill, that people are more divided than ever, that we've got this kind of left-right divide and the left looks at the right and the right looks at the left and no one seems to really trust each other anymore? Uh, no, I just don't think any of that's real. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, and the people from England and around, you guys always ask these questions. Like, what's it like? <laughs> Everybody yelling at each other and walking around with a machine gun. And it's just like, it's like, you know what I mean? I, I'm trying to think of the stereotype of where you guys come from. It's just, it's just not this, it's, it's, it's kind of, you, you are what they show. Mm. Yeah. And what, what everybody shows now is heightened emotions because there's so many places to look at things. Like crazy gets people to stop and watch. But like actual, you know, people just chilling out. No one wants to see that. They want to see like fighting and that type of thing. So um, I know what you're saying, but we've been talking to people. Hey, you've been here for a week. You got it down, True. man. <laughs> <laughs> Please, by all means, tell me about my country. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just asking the question, Bill. Yeah. Uh, well, that's cool. I answered it. You and did. And you're still going back. Yeah, but according, you know, <laughs> I know you guys are going to go back to England. Oh, they're fucking fat. <laughs> Everybody's got a gun in the visor of their car. I know what you guys are going to do. You know what? Actually, Americans are not that fat. It's the fat Americans who are extra fat. Most Americans are the same as the British. Well, our food supply is poison. Yeah. It was yeah. taken over by one group of people and they own the rights to the seeds and all of that type of stuff. And they forced out all of these farmers. If their seeds blew onto their property, they could sue them for using their seeds. And the media just ignored all of that because they get paid by them. That's sort of what is going on globally is everybody is, is just choosing money on the bag, as fucking kids say nowadays. Um, that's what the problem is. Nobody is, uh, you know, they're, everybody's screaming and yelling about shit that doesn't matter like stand-up comedians. They'll, they'll yell about that, but they won't talk about literally people uh, poisoning their own countrymen. I mean, they should be fucking put to death for what they did. There you go, there's a hot take. <laughs> I mean, I know if I did it, if I did it, if I fucking went to one donut shop and put something in a fucking donut that hurt somebody or caused them to have some sort of medical episode, that would be a, I would not be sitting here right now. But they somehow, you know, you know how it is. Catholic Church can do what they do. Kind of move people around and uh, <laughs> everything's all right. As long as you're fucking, you know, you're paying people, it's good. So that's what it is. <laughs> you talk a lot about masculinity in your current special. Why is it that you talk about it so much now? Was it because I of the never talked about masculinity. I talked about myself. Oh, OK, right. And then you're rebranding it as, as masculinity. masculinity. Okay. I'm just glad you didn't say toxic. <laughs> 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 but you know, I, the reason I guess why I spoke about masculinity is because it's a lot of a lot of things that men connect with. You know, that feeling, you know, of anger. You know, the the relationship with the father, not being able to process that, having kids, being a dad, and going, oh, I don't want to pass this stuff on to my kid. Right. I'm sure my dad thought that. I think, man, my kids will will think that. There's always stuff that you're gonna like. 
you know, you're going to make mistakes. Um, I just think the big thing is apologizing to them and addressing in the moment that you did it, that you messed up and that you're really sorry. And then I go back to it two or three times. Um, I did that. I messed up the other day with my daughter. And then uh, I was saying, I can't believe I did that. I'm really, I, the third time I apologize. I, I was like, uh, it makes me sad that I did that. And she was like, I don't want you to be sad. Oh. I was just like, all right, mm. it's good. Now. We're good now. Yeah, it was really cute. I became a dad a few months ago, so I haven't got to that stage yet. Uh, how has that changed you, the experience of being becoming a father and being a father? Um, oh, God, I actually, the thing I learned is like, you know, you think, you know, you buy some huge house and they have all the toys and then you're going to have like this, you're going to raise a good empathetic person. It's not how it works. It's like you can give them everything in the world. The one, the biggest thing that they need is your time. So if you're busy, like everybody in this business is, um, you have to say no to stuff and you have to like, you know, like my big thing was I went on, you know, everything has an app now. Like my daughter's school has an app. So I just looked up when's her fall break, when's the Christmas break, when's February, when's April. And I just sent that to everybody. Like, I'm not working these weeks. So, um, you know, uh, yeah, she said some like heartbreaking shit to me. Like kids just, really, <laughs> kids really get to like, you know, I shot a movie earlier this year and she's like, dad, can you, you know, can you hang out with me today? And I was like, ah, you know, I go, I got to work today. And she's like, ah, oh. and I said, no, I go, I'm on, I got two more days left on this movie. And she goes, uh, she goes, I don't like when you do movies. And I was like, I don't like it. I go, I don't like it either. And then she goes, I go, but I'm done in two days. And she goes, good. Then you can play with me forever. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you just walk out like I am the worst parent but it's just like this is how I fucking pay for our life so I have to go do this shit so um, like those things you have to let those things land mm. and sit in the pain of them and be like all right I need to make sure I do and then it's like I'm gonna have to go to work so I just have to make sure I don't work I gotta have that balance of you know, keeping the lights on and then like, like being there. But like, I am there a lot though. That is the great thing about this job is like, I kind of work when I want to work. Um, it's just once every two weeks, I go away for three days, you know, on, you know, some sort of gig or whatever, but I don't do anything longer than like three, three, four days. The last question we ask, and this is going to sound funny given what you've just said, is what's the one thing when, <laughs> not when, bad, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day, dude. You ask him the question. Yeah. Man. Okay. So Theo, the last question yeah. we always ask is, what's right, the thing? Look one more time. Is this mirror? F this is a good mirror? Yeah, it is a good mirror. Did this chain be out the whole time? <laughs> oh, no, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? Mm. I think they... Oh, dude, I remember one time I saw these f massive birds, right? They call them in your yeah, country. Yeah, they call massive them birds. birds. Beautiful, strong. <laughs> uh, I swear, bro, I went to this I went to this place called Newcastle. Have you heard of this? Yes, yes. yeah, we've okay. heard of Newcastle. And this taxi drops me off, and there was these, it was like a part, like a, I don't know if it was looked like a bachelorette party or something, and, the, and this foyer of like a big, there was a big room, like a big window, and they were in there naked, mm -hmm. you know? What do you call it? Tits? Yes. yes. Tits. And they were beating each other with pillows in there, bro. And I sat out there and watched, smoked a cigarette out there. Right out there, And boy. that's the one thing no one's <laughs> talking about. Huh? And that's the one thing bro, no one's talking about. There was seven of these women in there. I can see why you brought it up. It's, yeah. an, it's an and important point And it was point, fucking, Theo. it was serious, man. Oh. That's fantastic. Well, Theo. It was serious, bro. See, I can't even do it justice because you can't even believe that it could happen, could you? <laughs> How, who would get seven women naked and have them pillow fight in front of a big, huge picture window? It's almost like they wanted to be seen, Theo. I don't know, man. That's fucking, that's beautiful, bro. It's good shit, man. All right. So well, where are you guys headed next, man? Uh, we're going to see the comedy show that you're part of. Oh, shit, man. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs>